and they're serious. And he, they put him in charge. What? Good evening and welcome very much <coughs> to Conversations, where it's a pleasure to welcome to the program a friend of mine from, uh, from, from a long time ago. That's Reed Stowe. And he is a, an, uh, a certainly a sailor man. He'll be able to be talking about that. He's a philosopher, and I think he's also a Buddhist, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of spirituality. All of those things are part of his uh, nature and his long life experience that he's going to share with us. And it's an exciting thing to welcome him to the program because he's a major, major figure on the world of adventure and expanding the human understanding of the universe and some of the implications of the spiritual components of what gives that meaning. And so, Reed, so, so pre pleasure it is for me to welcome you to the program here this, e this afternoon. Ah, well, thank you, Harold. It's always good to come and have a conversation with you. Yes, indeed. We've been knowing each other for about, what, how about 30 Almost years? 20 years. 20 yeah, 20 years. 20 years. 20 years. 20 years like that. And Reed, of course, is famous in the world for having been uh, the, the not only the, pr the, the producer of the actual uh, s uh, sloop, uh, uh, a ship that he built with his own hands lovingly on the coast of the uh, United States of America, Carolina somewhere, and they build it all up from uh, scratch, as it were, and so forth, lovingly built the, sc the schooner uh, Anne, I think it was called, in after your mother, if I'm not yes. mistaken, and he sailed on the oceans of the world uh, <coughs> singularly very often and uh, with uh, a, 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 so, so, uh, a, a, an appreciation of spiritual values that he used in terms of uh, keeping his, uh, his steady understanding of the spiritual values that are inherent in the thing. He scared on the, with the sloop, he sailed on the offices of the world singularly, very long periods of time and set records on that pat in that way. And he also produced a great deal of very beautiful art that we're going to be talking about here now and that. A major uh, figure of, uh, of uh, in t interest in terms of the human condition by a young man who's done a great deal of exploration of the really important values, human values that we have before us now. And it's such a pleasure to welcome you to the program, Reed. Thank you. I've had the pleasure of knowing you for a little bit. I saw you off when you went with Sonia on the sailing away, mm -hmm. and I was there when you sailed back up the Hudson River, yeah. and it was to the great accompaniment of you having been out for a long time. But I've rambled on enough now. Maybe you could share yourself, your own uh, story, as it were, and uh, the things that are of particular value to it. And one of the things we want to stress, if you don't mind and everything, is that you are you are a spiritual and so forth, but you're also an artist uh, in painting, and this is something that's uh, relatively new, I think. But I, I hope you could share that with us. And also, if you don't mind, I think there's a major article that might be appearing in some of the press that's going to be calling attention to your life and your life's experience in the near term, uh, maybe around when this program might air. And so, all of that said, I'm wondering if I could hand it over to you and uh, fill in for the audience yourself, your own story, in a way that is more relevant with your own understanding of your own experience. Okay, ready, go. Go, yeah. Well, uh, so Harold mentioned a lot of things, and uh, uh, well, what I would begin to point out is that I'm most well known for doing the longest sea voyage in history. Mm -hmm. So it was something I prepared for a lifetime mm -hmm. and I and I don't I must have been almost 55 years old before I was even able to depart on mm -hmm. that voyage. Mm -hmm. And I I sailed 1152 days without stopping, without receiving supplies, the longest sea voyage in history. Could you say that one more time? Uh, if you google the mm -hmm. longest sea voyage in history, my whole story comes up. Yeah. I went to sea, stocked up on the boat for over three years and sailed 1,152 days without stopping, without res resupply until I arrived back in New York City 
in the summer of 210. Oh, that makes me think of, uh, of uh, all the great, all the great uh, explorers of the universe and so forth. You're right up there with the great explorers of the universe that have gone into new territory and expanded the, 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 the realm of uh, knowledge by the human society, by its yeah. intrepid uh, uh, people dedicated to expanding the overall spiritual and or uh, material uh, understanding of the planet. Well, that's interesting that you say that uh, because uh, as a teenager, when I first started sailing, sailing off into the South Pacific, uh, I was already an artist. I knew I was an artist all my life, and my art has always had a big influence over me since I was a child. So when I had the opportunity to sail through the South Pacific as a teenager, um, uh, I dropped out of college, and I went sailing in the South Pacific with another teenager. And while there, we met very spiritual older men who were sailing small boats by themselves with no motor, no radio, no electricity. And it was these men that I met in the South Pacific that introduced me to the idea that you could go to sea and not have to think about going to land. But were you, you weren't on your own ships at that point. You had yet to build the ships that you were going to sail onward in the future. But you had to build those. You had to be inspired to build the ships yourself by your hand, by hand. Well, it wasn't yes. like you ordered it up from the local uh, uh, store. The some supplies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yachts to people that are very wealthy and all that sort of thing. Right. You did it lovingly, I, and I with the support of your family. With yeah. it must have been hard for your mother to let you go so easily, or your father. Well, they were always very supportive <coughs> and were. always very helpful. Yeah, and. Uh, even my grandfather was an important person that helped me with my sailing aspirations. Because our family has a, a, a house on the intercoastal waterway near the South Carolina border mm -hmm. in North Carolina mm -hmm. that my dad and granddad and uncles built when I was a little baby. And we grew up going there all of our vacations and weekends and, and so forth. So I learned about boats and the water from my granddad, dad, and uncles, and I learned about boat building from them, so I looked on while they were building and repairing boats. And you're talking as a teenager almost? Now? No, as a little baby. As I, a I baby, was always, as a little baby. always around that and boats. So you were raised on it like a, a real mariner. On our vacations. Like a, like on a mariner. our vacations. Mariner, you know. Well, yeah. my dad was in the Air Force, yeah. so we grew okay. up traveling. Right. But we okay. always went back that to the family own. house yeah, on right. the water. Right, right. On the water. It's on the water, yeah. which I'm lucky about that because yeah. then I had a place where I could build a boat and launch it. Yeah, build a boat is kind of a big thing. Well, my dad. Is that the Anne? Well, the, my <laughs> first boat. Uh, my dad uh, built a few boats <coughs> when I was a little kid, so I yeah. saw that. Okay, and yeah. I built surfboards through high school, so I learned the boat building skills like that. After I sailed the South Pacific for a year as a teenager, I came back to my granddad and said, can I live at the family house and build an ocean-going boat? And what was the boat that you were sailing around in the Pacific on if that wasn't ocean going? Well, that belonged to another friend who I was sailing with. But that was his boat. That was his boat. But now you're going to I make sailed your, with you him. You wanted to make your own boat. I wanted my own boat. And you wanted to boat. sail out into the oceans of the world, uh, perhaps uh, with yeah. no resupply or something like that, which is uh, part of something that's a little bit uh, unique. Well, when you go to boat to the sea in any boat, you have to stock the boat up with food and yeah. water and all your supplies. <clears throat> and w when you go from one place to the next, mm -hmm. you're out there in the wide open ocean and you have to take care of yourself until you get where you're going. So Boy, what a being, challenge. What being a challenge. on a boat huh? is, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's a challenge and it's a wonderful lifestyle to be free, sailing across the waves of the ocean it's just a real beautiful which, which thing. Uh, which, uh, which potion do you recommend for seasickness? You know, because you've got considerable experience on the sea. Which one of the uh, various uh, things that the industry of, um, uh, you know, cosmetics and so, or whatever they call it, uh, uh, you recommend for uh, seasickness? 
I don't know about that. Luckily, I've never been seasick, I'm so a I don't joke. have to I'm deal with it. A joke, well, I there are there are sea captains that sail all around that get seasick. Yeah, there there's pills you I can take. Them. There's uh, acupuncture bands that press on your wrists that are supposed to help. No. There's different things yeah. like that. And since I've not gotten seasick, I'm not up on what all the different You've kinds never been are. Never seasick. No. Never. Never. And you've been on the oceans of the world about a thousand years or something like that almost. You've been well, never all got my sick. life. Well, Isn't more that than amazing? that, I yeah. never was sick. <coughs> and I never got hurt. No. And that's an incredible thing. It is So as, as I sailed from one place to the next, I developed a consciousness where I got very intensely into what I was doing yeah. and I had to become the ultimate seaman. Seamanship comes first. Build my boat. Learn to navigate with an old brass sextant. Because back in those days, in, in, from 1971 when I sailed, up until 1986, 87, we had to navigate with sextants and do it in the old-fashioned way. What the heck is a sextant? But by That's the thing where you read measure where the sun You is measure the something? sun. Yeah. yeah. But uh, by 1986, 87, they started to have satellite navigation devices that would give you a position. <laughs> Sometimes you'd get your position four times a day. But after using a sextant, to get that position from the satellite was like a luxury. Well, now they have the GPS, and that gives you a constant position. And, and now they have GPS chart readers that give you a constant position where you are on the chart as a dot all the time. So the navigation has become much easier because you don't have to use a sextant to, to navigate. And safer. It's safer because uh, to, to know where you are when you're a sailor at sea is very important. I would think so. The, the, the oceans are very big. They're big and, and most, uh, boats, water. most boats through history yeah. um, didn't sink at sea uh, but crashed on the shore is that or right? rocks. They'd oh have yeah, to be on the rocks, very much by far. Yeah, right, right, right. right. So, they think so if you don't know where you are, you yeah. end up running into rocks or yeah. the land. And, and also, so how like you sailing it in your uh, solo, and large for large periods of time, and living off the sea, and yes. the and the environment, what the environment presented within reasonable context that you had brought on the ship, but you were sailing in a way that was uh, very very uh, uh, unique in terms of uh, the way in which you were going to project for long periods of time, including the food and so forth like that. It was a real experience that you had set up for yourself mm -hmm. probably could be recommended to a lot of other young people coming along but I don't know how well, did you course. did you feel a little bit odd when you first got the idea of doing that or did you concern were you concerned your family members were they concerned that you were going to be dashed like all the you know the the, the, the boat the, 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 the sailings from the 19th century and so forth at the hands of mother nature that can be very cruel at the sea the cruel sea isn't there a book called the cruel sea or something there must have been a lot of people in your family who were concerned about your uh, safety and your 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 prospect as you sailed out on the world on the sea oceans of the world well when uh, I built my first boat at the our family beach cottage and it was a very small 26 foot long plywood and fiberglass catamaran mm -hmm. with, with uh, uh, no deck in the middle and it weighed 1,400 pounds so it turned out to be the smallest boat to cross the, the Atlantic Ocean two times but when I went to sea on that boat uh, in uh, the summer of 1973 of course my mom was worried yeah. and she uh, she anyway told the newspaper and they did a big story on it uh -huh. and uh, uh, and my mom did most of the talking my dad is more quiet yeah. so my mom was more worried and she would she went to a church camp and got all the ladies to pray for me <laughs> and uh, and she did all the talking yeah. for the article yeah and yeah. when they sent me the article after I had crossed the North Atlantic Ocean and I was and yeah. I was in Portugal yeah. mm -hmm. I read the article and uh, it, it said, Reed's father, Harry, he just said in black, I'd like to be out there with him. <laughs> so right. I, that really brought <clears throat> me close to my dad. I, and I knew he was always supportive. But to hear yeah. that, I thought, wow, that's really fantastic. Yeah. So my mom had to worry yes, a, right. a bit about me while I was on my adventures, where my dad was, was more like... Uh, 
uh, you know, wishing he could be out there. But they both got used to me being out there and uh, relating to this story. (laughs) At one time I was sailing up to the Caribbean from uh, from the South Atlantic and uh, a late hurricane was coming. I try not to sail where hurricanes are. But a late hurricane was coming and I was crossing the Caribbean getting ready to sail back to North Carolina. And my parents saw on TV that this hurricane was coming and uh, I had a, an Iridium satellite telephone on board at that time. It was about uh, the year 2000. And we had this satellite telephone, so I called mom and dad and said, well, I'm here at sea and everything's fine. And they said, we're looking at where you are and it looks like a hurricane is coming. <laughs> and they both started laughing. Um, I, and so they started laughing just because uh, I think by that time they sort of weren't too worried about me or maybe their laughing was nervousness. Yeah, well, they'd I'm not you, sure, they'd but they, decades, they so told they, me that yeah. the hurricane was coming and we were in the path of the hurricane. Yeah, and you were but also luckily hurting. the hurricane right. uh, moved and it, and it didn't hit, hit us. So. Yeah, but you also but, uh, had presented so a way of life that made them give, have great confidence in your ability to function very well out on the sea or anywhere I think, a young man. Uh, I it, think, uh, you know. I came up with the idea to do the longest sea voyage in history That's in 1986 when I was in New Zealand preparing to make an expedition to Antarctica with the boat. There was and, a famous guy you were there. And I said, what can I do next yeah. whereby I will evolve? Because I don't like challenges. People say, I'm going to do this challenge or that challenge, or I'm going to follow in the footsteps of this explorer. Mm-hmm. I didn't never identify with that. What I wanted to do was, if I make an expedition to Antarctica with my sailboat, that's mm-hmm. the most you can do in the world. That's, that's as far as you can go. But and I said, sailboat. what can I do yeah. to evolve? Yeah. And that was when I got the idea for the thousand day voyage, the longest sea voyage in history was in New Zealand uh, before going to Antarctica. But that was 1986. And so for the next 20 years, I lived as the guy who was going to do the longest sea voyage in history. I didn't have a job. I had my boat and I was trying to get what I needed to do the longest sea voyage in history, but of course no one believed me and no one would sponsor me and everyone thought it was impossible. And it was it was a 20 year process of me having to educate everyone about how I knew I could do it. It's and a, what it boils a, down yeah, to on, yeah. is that, um, uh, and it relates to what Harold was talking about, from the beginning as I made sea voyages I had to make myself seaworthy and I made my voyage and I started to make longer and longer voyages and I didn't really care where I was going. For me it wasn't about the land, it was about the sea and my boat and when I came up with the idea to do the longest sea voyage in history I said well geez I know I can do it because I've had successful voyages for this 15 years of my life all I have to do is keep doing what I've always done but just do it a little bit longer and so that meant when I was at sea I had successful voyages and I tuned into the ocean and I tuned into the boat and I took care of myself when I sailed alone and when I had a crew I took care of my crew and so I said well I can do the longest sea voyage in history if I just keep doing what I've done my whole life. You did all of that instead of getting a job at at Sears and Roebuck selling stuff. Uh, Why why did you waste your life doing all that kind of nonsense when you could have gotten a good paying job at the local Sears store selling paint? Well, or maybe uh, even, you know what I mean. Uh, I, I never considered that did, sort of thing. I was more <laughs> over swept away. Yeah, I was swept right. away. I love it. From, when, away, I, yeah. from when I set sail and started going, and then I found myself in a far place in the world. I was uh, um, 21 years old, and I was in Portugal by myself. And then I said, well, I met <laughs> these people, and they said, you got to go to Morocco you got to go to Essaouir, Mogador, Morocco, because Jimi Hendrix was just there, and he did an air guitar concert for everyone. Were you there for that? No, I was. No. I was in the yeah, Azores you, at the you're time, on your way to and it. they told me Jimi Hendrix oh, did an air Jimmy guitar get along? Get along okay? concert yeah. in Morocco. I I saw him. I saw one of his 
his I saw his concerts yeah, but did you get when chum? I was a did kid. You get chummy? Did I you didn't get to meet know him, each other? Did but you I knew that he was home? in this place, Mogador, Morocco, oh, yeah. and had done this air guitar concert. So and everyone an said, "That's to you. where you got to go." So yeah. I said, "Well, do you have a chart of that place?" And mm. they said, "Yeah." Uh, and I took my uh, writing paper and put it down on the yeah, chart yeah. and traced the chart of Mogador, Morocco mm -hmm. and traced it in pencil and put the <laughs> coordinates on it and I said, okay, that's where I'm going. So I ended up sailing there alone. Did you learn how to when, say avast? Uh, no, don't they say avast, matey? Avast. Something like that. You know? I never was or, or, real traditional. Uh, oh. Some sailors have special ways of calling everything and there's a special sailing lingo I never paid too much attention to that, and you were too I good. never even wanted to get a captain's license. Mm -hmm. I was into the boat and into the sailing, and I, I just couldn't pay attention to other you stuff. You were like what is called a free spirit. Free if spirit. If I may, if I mean, I don't free, want to put words in free your mouth, spirit but you are a spirit, uh, uh, an adventurer, well, and you are a free spirit, and you've also got tremendous spiritual re uh, resources that you draw upon. You you have great spiritual such that, and you have a tremendous sense of uh, of adventure, adventure that you act upon, and not just talk about or think about. Right. Now that's an amazing kind of bio that should be of great interest to a great number of people. I suppose it has been, mm -hmm. and I'm, I wager it's gonna become of interest to a whole lot more people when they fully get the uh, story of Reed Stowe. Well, that's what I'm gonna- I think what that's something we should do. And think that's about what I'm trying to explain right now, Reed. is yeah. that this may be my life, and it may be very unique, and it may be what I've done, but I see it as a part of everyone's psyche as a part of everyone's soul, everyone comes into contact with something in their dreams mm -hmm. that lifts their spirit and takes them on a journey. And we know that to be the story of mankind yes. through the ages. Right, right. So, and in a sense, um, everyone wants to take that journey in some way but they're if they're bold and free and if they that's right scared How many people if they're are bold able and free and want to come into contact with that in themselves what percentage of the world population is capable of leading a life of adventure like that I without all the attendant possibilities for fear i don't know, you know well, like fear they, is they, a real important thing i'll talk about that in a minute but boat, since you're speaking of it sink at the middle of the ocean and they could die that man be has always been afraid but the the, the idea of uh, of going on a boat into the unknown, well, that's the story of Ulysses, which yes, is really right. supposed to be mm. our first great epic written story in yeah, our Western right. culture. Yeah, was yeah. Uh, So people have always been enamored by these adventures on boats into the unknown, and of course we know that to be an important part of history, yeah. how man uh, voyaged on the seas right. and how the world was discovered and how the world grew had a lot to do with what men could do on well, boats. Right, and expand and, and expand that. And you know, there's spiritual qualities to it as well. That, <clears throat> that I know you've had interest, in, you, you, you've also got a spiritual part of your own uh, making and uh, of, your own, of your own makeup. And it makes for a very good bio in terms of your uh, decision making on how you're going to lead your life. You're also an artist, well, and a painter, and an artist, and a, a an appreciation. You have an appreciation of art and expression and spiritual qualities. So well, I think art, it might be uh, well worth yeah. mentioning some so of that we, too. I, uh, to, we really to wanted to start by um, talking about the boat and my adventuring, because that's uh, adventure. what I'm best known for the longest sea voyage in history which you can google and get my whole story yeah. and uh, but really uh, long before I actually began sailing um, I was an artist and as a child I was uh, an artist I always was occupied painting and drawing and my mom saved all my my stuff so I found in the attic a paint a drawing that I did when I was six years old. Was it? It's twelve feet long. Yeah, really. If it's you a got twelve it, if you foot. Still got I still have it. Is it in the? Is it's it in, in my the, in mom the, and dad's house. Oh, and, but it's not in the Louvre or something. You well, know, I, I mean, oh no, but go ahead. Yeah, let's wait mom, and see about that. Yeah, yeah, it's maybe, twelve feet maybe, long, yeah. and it's uh, me drawing boats. Yeah, and I have 
all of these boats, first they're on the land being built, then yeah. they're in the water and they're being loaded with cargoes and you can see inside the boat and see where the cargoes are and Tells there's the hundreds story, of yeah. men climbing on them and then yeah. the boats are on the sea and it's 12 feet long. Wonderful. So even at That's that really early age, I was in... Is it figured? Yes, it was drawn. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Even at that yeah. early age, my art was taken by um, the my, my drawing and, and so forth. So that uh, by the time I got ready to build my first boat, when I was 20 years old, um, I knew that I had the power through my art to invest a spiritual life and quality into my boat through my boat building. Magnificent. And yeah. when Magnificent. I got ready to uh, go across the North Atlantic in this tiny boat with no motor, no radio, no electricity, no life raft. I'm scared. I of said, well, what it. can I do to help assure that I'll stay alive? And then I, I said, well, geez, I need to carve figureheads. And that was why I started sculpting. It was a matter of life and death. I'd been painting all my life and I had actually done some sculptures also, but I needed to make figureheads. So I called on the gods and when I pounded my chisel, I said, I'm making this magic head. It's going to communicate with you, what and you have to come and take care of me. And uh, what was the I wouldn't say what was the wood, wood, wood. Oh, yeah, wood, wood. wood, wood. I wouldn't yeah, say yeah, at no. that time I was uh, uh, as well aware that every culture through time around the world right. made so figureheads for their boats. Absolutely. Or, yeah. the, or they painted yeah. eyes on right, their boats. Right, they, right. All the, the sailors and the men who helped the sailors go to sea believed that this is what they had to do to stay alive in that very alien and dangerous place. Mm -hmm. And for instance, whoever made the dragon figureheads for the Vikings mm -hmm. might have been someone like me mm -hmm. who knew that those men weren't going to leave their cozy houses and their beautiful women under the fur covers of their bed unless that spirit on the boat was calling them and telling them, I'm going to take you on this adventure and I'm going to take care of you. Someone had to make that uh, dragon figurehead on the Viking boat and he was the shaman, a leader of the spirit of the people of that culture and that time. And that's what I tapped into when I made my figureheads and that's really what I am now. So that spirit that was ancient flows through me now yeah. and it's manifested in what I have actually done yeah. by sailing on the sea far, far longer than any man. Yeah. And that's how my deep spirit worked through my art to help me do that. And the other part of it that's equally important is that as a teenager, I started doing yoga. So through yoga, I compounded my spiritual abilities and my psychic abilities because I used ancient techniques 2000 years BC um, and followed their practices to uh, learn how to keep myself in shape, yeah. yes, yeah. but how to <clears throat> tap into a world much larger than you can comprehend with what an intellectual you? mind. Yeah, what yeah, is the spiritual mind where you learn how to see oh. and tap much greater things, bigger things, things that are timeless, transcend time mm -hmm. from the ancient early man all the way into the future. And it was these things that I tapped through my yoga and through my art. And that's what gave me a leading edge beyond a sailor who's just intellectual and well skilled. I had this vision that was a part of me that empowered me and carried me on. So uh, that's I'd, how the boat mm -hmm. and the sailing mm -hmm. got through the art to do what I do. So the art that I make, the art empowered me to do the longest sea voyage in history and depart the touch of the earth far longer than any human ha ever has. And now in turn, <laughs> this voyage <coughs> empowers my art. So mm -hmm. the art that I'm making now and the art that you see behind me mm -hmm. and the art that I'm gonna be showing you and talking about yeah, right. is the art that empowered the voyage and in turn the voyage empowered the art. I'm, a lot of the art I made before the voyage during the voyage and after the voyage really? and I mix it all up so it's hard for me to say when was this piece done? Uh -huh. Yes, 
I started this piece in 1976, mm -hmm. and it's only finished now in 2019, and uh, a lot of the work that's in my art show here now in Chelsea, New York, yeah. the heart of the most important art that place in the world, ago, yeah, are yeah. these paintings that I'm describing that w were a part of the voyage. Yeah, and we're going to show some of those, right? We've yeah. got some we got on display and everything like that. And that's a, that's a that's a major statement. That's a, a statement worthy of. It ought to be down in um, in the Library of Congress or something in order to be <laughs> recorded for posterity <laughs> because it's the image. It's the it's the, it, it, for particularly, I don't know if it's a male or something like that, but adventure like that and going off and testing the th thing like that and then taking spiritual guidance from that is something that ought to be encouraged to a whole lot of people. I wonder if the, uh, the opportunities for somebody to leave that kind of a life, there's actual risk, there's actual re exen uh, extension of your capability and everything, Whereas you could have just stayed at home and got a job at Sears and be okay, well, you would have uh, a new car and that kind of thing. But do you understand what I'm saying? But to have the real important values become part of the life of increasing numbers of people would be something that ought to be encouraged by all of our spiritual leadership or even our political leadership. Well, that's it's values that should be encouraged and they're not nearly encouraged enough because most people are just looking for security. Well, uh, that's very, very true. That's yeah. very true, and of course that uh, has always been my objective and my goal. I was swept away and became swept very away. well aware. What a wonderful Well, concept. I say swept, swept away. It's swept so, away. It's so romantic in a way. Because I yeah. see the flow it's of great. energy coming great. from behind me, yeah, right. taking me and moving me forward, right. and as I do what I do, I become very well aware that I am evolving. Mm -hmm. And by doing what I do, I help humanity mm -hmm. evolve. So mm -hmm. as I opened up different uh, ways of seeing right, and acting right, through right. my life, I education. became aware yeah, that yeah, yeah. it was helping humanity open their mind and look at possibilities of where they could go. You, you, you're right. When yeah, I you, speak yeah, of yeah, yeah. the longest sea voyage in history, yeah, it was a, a it was event. really a voyage out onto the open How ocean. How long was that? How long did that take? You're on a ship. You're on a ship. What's its dimensions? It's 20 feet or something like well, that? It's like my, being in a rowboat. My big boat right? now no. is 70 feet long and 16 feet wide, 10 feet deep under the water, and it weighs 60 tons. And so a that's boat a that big, big, kind of a, big boat. a boat that big then yeah. has the ability to ride storms real well, but importantly, uh, it has the ability to carry a big cargo yeah, and a lot of bird? water. Where is it bird? Well, at this very moment, uh -huh. it's on the Cape Fear River in North Carolina. Okay, okay, that's a place, yeah, I like that. Yeah, okay. But that kind of thing is really, really exp in, in, inspirational to you. And I think it is, and I think that people are going to be very, very interested in your story. I suppose many people have been. How well have you been able to share this with the wider population of the world with the kind of fervor or interest or accolade uh, that it deserves, the story of your life? Okay. Have you been able to share that as well as it ought to have been shared uh, by well, others? I mean, and yes, also I, picked I have. up as an inspiration to others and become very much of a leading element of particularly with some of the young men coming along and so forth, young having something men. you can do yeah. other than get a job at Sears. Well, uh, or, uh, or, or even in the, in the executive offices of Sears or something, out in the world of pushing the real spiritual end of the society like you've been able to do. Yeah, well, to, to tell you about how a lot of this began for me, when I was building my first boat, I was 20 years old and I was alone, and I old. was practicing uh, meditation every yeah. day throughout my work, and at night I was alone, and uh, as, the wind, as, as fall came on, it was cold, I lit the little fire to stay warm, and I prayed, and I said, oh, thank you, God, for allowing me to follow my dreams. A little and fire. this Why is what I want to do. Because there a was a fire? fireplace in our family's house. Yeah, but was house. it a big fire? It was a fireplace, but a stove, wood stove. But did it, did it make it, 
a 75 and 80 degrees, or was it 20 well, degrees? Well, not quite. You could make when it, it was, just, you could just barely it wasn't a winterized you, house, it wasn't but it was enough to keep me and warm. And could you live with nature even when she's being nasty with a blizzard or something well, like that? Well, yes, not just I always it's had just a little wood burning sunshine. stove is a nice thing to have when you're living in nature in Absolutely. a cold place. Yes. Um, so I was alone. And I was having these big dreams about what I was going to do with this boat and where I was going to go. Yeah. And I literally felt these presences yeah. around me okay. as if people were around me. Yeah. And they said, Reed, you're always going to be able to do whatever you can conceive and you'll be okay. Wait a minute. All Wait you have minute. to do yeah. is give more than you receive. Wait so I heard oh that God. in words. You sound like some... You, no, you, I no, heard those, those that in words. Those are, spir those are so words. This those relates. are words that have meaning. And Can I talk for a minute? Oh, yeah. I want to yeah. answer your question. Go ahead. Uh, those, uh, um, uh, the idea of giving more than you receive. Yeah. So he asked, how long, uh, how well have I been able to share what I was doing? So at that early age, I became aware that I had to give more than I received. I was being given this wonderful yeah, gift right. of being able to follow my wildest dreams and being taken care of and, uh, by, and opened up and cared for by the spiritual world, by nature. So I had to actively give and give and give. Yeah. And it didn't mean that I had to take care of my old grandma. It meant that I had to give to humanity in a larger way and help take care of the spirit of humanity. Beautiful, beautiful, so beautiful, uh, yeah. uh, as I went along, then I started to realize that as I was getting more and more media story stories, and I have hundreds, that the media was helping me share my story with the world. So therefore, the media was compounding my ability to share a good message out into the world, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm here now. But asking, have I been able to do it as well as I would like and as much as it de deserves? I, uh, even though I've had four feature stories in the New York Times and my fifth one is coming out yeah. this Sunday, yeah. I still say, no, I haven't been able to as much as I want to and as much as it deserves, but that potential is uh, here in my future. So I actively have to give back as much as I can to make up for all I've been given. Yeah. But this is a thing of energy because the yeah, energy is right. flowing you're through right. me yeah. and if I don't do it, I'm gonna explode. So yeah. I'm actively explode. going, don't I got explode. to do it, so I have to share what I'm doing because of what I've been given. Yeah. And uh, so my art does it and yeah. my art does it, if you look at it and if you start to understand my art, that will do it to you. It will lift you up. It will uh, help me spread my love, consciousness, energy to everyone. My art will do it, and my stories will do it as I talk and as I share. And the, ultimately, what it leads to, when I went out to sea and I went into the unknown for over three years where there is nothing, yeah, yeah, I had yeah, to yeah. leave behind yeah. everything of the earth yeah, I would have been and take a journey into the yeah. unknown. Yeah. It was almost like taking a journey into death wow. because there was nothing yeah. and I could bring nothing with me. Uh -huh. uh, and certainly it was scary, but there was nothing and I could bring nothing with me. So it was like a journey into death and ultimately every human has to take that journey. So at some time in your life, you're gonna be left uh, um, alone somewhere probably in your bed with your own mind going, well, I, I think time, end, everything's yeah. almost over for me mm -hmm. uh, here, here on earth, mm -hmm. and I'm going somewhere else. I'm gonna have to take a journey somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So my journey is an important thing for every human, and learning how I made my journey is relevant for people coming to terms with their own life and their own mortality mm -hmm. and the realization that you can go uh, uh, into the unknown with who you are and make that transition into that space. So this journey yeah. into the unknown is relevant for everyone in the world. And that's what I'm trying to words. share. Magnificent words that yeah. can be shared by many, many people and it would be very good for the whole human society to imbibe, imbibe that sentiment.
much more than they've been able to. Yeah. I wonder what prevents right. so few people to be able to take that real hard step of being uh, confronting the spiritual qualities that are available, uh, which are part of the human condition, and uh, just retreat to safety and that kind of thing. Because that that right, requires that well, requires that's the spirit a and uh, and a spirit of adventure. It, if that's an overworked term, right? But an experience of adventure. You've mentioned fear a couple of times, yeah. and what you're talking about yeah, now. Yeah, so like I'm going to bring yeah, up the yeah, point yeah. of my process of going further and further on the sea. As I was open in my mind, I felt that I had to go through the fears of every man of every man and woman yeah. from the beginning of time that was afraid of the sea in one way or the other, the world, depending on the world. what in what age it was mm -hmm. they had their fears. I had to go through their fears right up to the modern times mm -hmm. when I have to pierce the fear of every man now in this modern time to go beyond where everyone is gone. I have to let the fear flow by me and I have to go through it. I think that there's a lot of other men that are smarter than me, more skillful than I am, maybe better sailors, and uh, um, but they can only go so far on the sea because they're afraid. And what are they afraid yeah. of? They can't well, cut their ties. I can think of a lot of things you could be afraid of. You know, like that storm and the lightning and the thunder and the and the, uh, those the howling are, winds and the those uh, are capsizing awesome. boats and all kinds of things. They can put up with most of that. Loss what of they can't job, put up of, with. You know, there you're getting things, to it. You know, yeah. You if you know. if there were other men who could yeah. leave their money behind yeah, and their security yeah. on the earth yeah, behind, right. yeah, yeah. then they could turn to the sea and become more seaworthy and then they could keep going. Or to the but sea of life. The it's most not just at the sea. It's the sea of life or the human condition that you're trying to have people be able to adjust to right. more gracefully and more appropriately in terms of the ultimate reality that we're living in. Well, it, that's it's, right. You know, there's much more well, to Well, so it. it does apply yeah. to people on the land. If yes. you want to see the more whole human condition. in what the human condition yeah. is, you can't be too caught up on your material things and feeling yeah. like that's the most important thing. Yeah. Because if you do, then you're not preparing yourself for that journey into the unknown. Yeah. If you do, you're holding yourself back from seeing a larger vision of what uh, everyone is capable of, what humans are capable of. Yeah, no. So, okay. uh, yeah. and when people <coughs> are able to let that go, they'll take longer and longer voyages on the sea in the case of guess, those who would do it. The sea is really something that has, we've got great, uh, great metaphors and everything of the sea being a thing, a metaphor for the way of life and everything like that. But the sea of the metaphor of the larger context is the sea of all of the questions that arise in the human spirit as they encounter their life's journey here in the world. That's very and relevant. And I think that there's a great need for some sort of a purpose other than just simple material success. That's right. In fact, one art critic but described my work mm. uh, as being necessary. And I thought well, that was a real then. good description. His Reed's work is necessary for people. It wasn't about whether it was pretty or whether it was cutting edge or, or, or what, it, but he said it's necessary for people. So now that we've talked about the art, and yeah. because I have show an art show up in Chelsea, yeah, let's see some of the I'd art. like to Don't you just see some, some more besides this painting can, here. Okay, let's yeah, just I think see you have some prepared, and let's And, like that. and let's you have are a look. having an article that's going to come out soon in the New York Times. And it's, it's about be. my art show and, that, and that, about that the art. That statement you made was worthy of a great deal of There's a lot of different ways to see my paintings and be and interpret them. And ever since I was very young, I always uh, was really happy when I saw that people said different things. Someone said it was this and someone said it was that and then they said, oh, now it looks like this to me. Yeah. So I've always liked that. So I've tried, always tried to leave my paintings where they would be open for interpretation. But because the, there are things you can see when you look at the painting and it does make you think of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. because, but because it's open for interpretation, mm -hmm. different people might see it in certain ways. Yeah. Now this one, for instance, you might say, well, oh, there's a thing yeah. and oh, there's a shadow. Mm -hmm. And then you might look a little more and say, oh, there's earth and mm -hmm. oh, 
there's something behind it mm -hmm. and then uh, maybe people don't look and see it all at all but for me in a lot of my work I, um, because I spent my life on the blue yes. and with the blue horizon, yes. Yes. I put a blue horizon in my paintings to, yeah. to carry your vision into the depth of the painting. Uh -huh. So there's a blue uh -huh. horizon in the painting. It is, yeah. Is that a general thing with your work? It is. You'll it see is, that. You so I often yeah. offer <clears throat> the, the blue horizon because it helps you drift into the painting past the objects that there's are in the front. There's a song about blue horizon. And there's also... Uh, um, maybe multiple blue horizons, maybe, and there yeah. is, so there's multiple blue horizons in this painting. You can carry oh, it back a song even further. The blue horizon, there rise a number. There's a song like that. This term, mm -hmm. the blue horizon, fits in. But this is beautiful, man. Oh, look at that. Okay. okay. Well, yep. This is another one. Uh, this one's a real big painting. It's about nine feet by five feet. Mm. So it's hard to see the details in this painting. Mm -hmm and what's there, but often I'm using the same thing. I've developed my style, yeah. so I'm using the same thing in my paintings over and over again. Uh -huh. uh, and one of the most obvious things in this painting is what is the texture? And the texture is earth. So I've been using sand and earth uh, in my paintings uh -huh. uh, uh, most of my life. In 1973, when I was in Morocco, I loved the orange-colored yeah. earth they yeah. had there, and yeah. it was called Berber. And yeah. so I collected sacks of this orange earth, mm -hmm. and I started putting it in my paintings. So as early as 1973, I was enamored by the use of earth and sand from different places around the world that I went. You made renditions but of the art. You didn't have the sand in the painting. Did you have oh, sand I, in the painting? I put the, I Did put, you put it connected I, to the art? I, I, I take a very thick, wet yeah. paint, yeah. And, I, and I put the earth on it, and I let it dry. Good or I you. put the sand on That's it, and I let it dry. And dimension. when I do woodwork, yeah. Yeah. my woodworking is a prayer, and it's an act of making what I need to go forward, and it's an act of survival. So that wood dust is empowered. So I always saved my sawdust and put it in bags, and I put my wood in. But uh, Where did you put the sawdust bags? I had little places I put everything. It's like sandbags. Sandbags, Maybe. sawdust bags. Yeah, okay. I carried my <laughs> sand. I carried my earth. Uh, so uh, in, in uh, 1986, when I determined to do the longest sea voyage in history, yeah. and I thought, how long is that? I realized, geez, I'm going to leave the touch of the earth longer yeah. than any human ever has. Yeah, people have said that. So if I'm going to do that, yeah. I need to bring earth with me on my spaceship because I won't have earth. How's that going to be for me? to leave the earth behind longer than anyone ever has, and I, I'm, I might be affected by that. My body, my physiology, my vibrations might be yearning for the earth because you know how it is when you stick your toes in the mud and when you're in nature and you touch the earth, it's healing for you, it connects with you, it affects the vibrations of your body. So I said, well, if I'm going to depart the touch of the earth longer than anyone. I need yeah. to bring the earth Some with me and that. the sand with me and yeah. the wood dust uh -huh. with me and all these different materials. Yeah. So uh, then I realized, well, the paintings that I'm making are going to be the best painting that an astronaut could take with him into space. Wow. No, that's so really because he needs to bring with him something like that. Well, I guess they give him desserts now and then. Maybe a dessert weighs this much. So I'm saying I'll make a painting that only weighs two desserts. So you can give up two desserts and you'll have something with you on that voyage that has a deep depth perspective. I put that blue horizon in. You'll have something you can touch and drag your hands on and feel the textures because otherwise you're only feeling the textures of the high-tech carbon fiber walls and these uh, plastic man-made materials. No, you need to touch earth and you need to touch sand and you need to touch wood. And as I did this, I started to realize that it's like alchemy. I'm putting together all of these different vibrations yeah. and like a magnet, the further apart they are, it's a different pull between them and how they mix together there's a different they're all communicating with each other and that gives the painting a special alchemy and a special vibration so my paintings should go with astronauts into space Have and <coughs> my paintings that's part graphically how my work helped me with my voyage 
because it's more than just a visionary way that it opens my mind and helps me see and perceive mm -hmm. and gives me vision to do something. Yeah. My paintings also affect my physiology, my yeah. body. How am yeah. I going to stay, stay healthy? So I had the earth with me, and while I was yeah. at sea, I hadn't touched land for, for two years. So I'm thinking, well, you, you know, serious? I'm going to... You hadn't touched land in two years? I didn't do it for over three years. Really? So I didn't touch land for over three years. Good. So uh, um, I put my, my uh, box down, and I poured my bag of earth over my feet, and I embedded my feet up up above my ankles and I sat there with my feet in the earth while there was nothing but ocean around me and that felt good and I did my thing I may have meditated I may have done my art but these are the practices that I did and you don't know exactly what each practice does along the way but I have the idea that these are all the things that I'm doing to need my keep myself healthy right I right. mean well, after I all yeah, I right. at sea I counted the waves they rocked me like this one two Three, what, you, you, four. You, so I realized I was going to get rocked longer than any man in history. In how, cradle, how is my body going to? Baby cradle. Yeah, how's yeah, that going to yeah. affect my body? Maybe yeah. my inner gyroscope is going to go. Human bodies don't take movement like this, but for right, so you, long. You get ill. You so get Ill. so I, I counted the waves. It's thirty-one thousand waves a day. Is about, that right? Oh. Yeah, that my body is. Rocking. Boy, you had a real education. So how man. am I gonna? Uh, uh, to how's that gonna affect me? It's a chance I took on my voyage because mm -hmm. I was committed to the time. We know that if astronauts go into space for a while, these bad things start happening you to them. You know they're going to be going it's to the difficult. moon. They're going to be going to the moon on mass now, just within our our lifetime here. Now they're going to be doing oh, well. large ventures on the moon. Well, I think that's interesting, and it's I think that whoever leaves this earth. Mm -hmm has a lot to learn from me and I can teach a lot because well, I'm say, leading yeah. in the evolution of humankind evolving off of the earth. Uh -huh. Since I was off of the earth three times longer than anyone else has That's ever right. been. That How did I do it? It wasn't an accident. Mm -hmm. It was a series of did very important steps. Did you know what you were doing when you steps. did it or did it come uh, no, on, I'm on, saying like it's on It's what I did all my life. Yeah. and. And, and I studied it on a lot of different levels and practiced it on a lot of different levels. I had to have the seamanship together. I had to have the physical things together. I had to have the intellectual things together. And I had to have the spiritual things together. Now you think you've the got combination it. of them it's all wonderful. in order to do it. Yeah, but I mean, you think you've got it together now, for instance. And you're going to have a, a major new uh, understanding among the world society. I don't remember. I remember you. I don't remember you doing all Let's this artwork. Let's see another painting. And, yeah, say more artwork. I like al that. I've always How been. How many pieces do you have? If they say in uh, art, uh, some hundreds. Hundreds of these paintings. Uh, right. Uh, these uh, expressions. So yeah. uh, uh, I see that you've picked uh, paintings, um, uh, and and I haven't seen this painting in a while, and it's just so nice to see it again. Mm -hmm. And as I go and describe it, and what I've been talking about, you see the earth in the painting. You see the sand in the painting. You see the deep blue of the ocean horizon far away. And I'm telling you about this now, but I'm not going to be in front of every painting to tell everybody. And no. in fact, I almost prefer that people look at the painting and just enjoy it as it is yeah. instead of uh, that I have to explain the painting. But I'm going to explain the paintings as, I, as we go because that's how people will understand my art and mm -hmm. what I do yeah, better. Right, right, right. All of my paintings <clears throat> have this mixture of elements together, mm -hmm. all the different kinds of things all mixed together. So I call them mixed media paintings. Mixed it's media. all different kinds of things in the painting mm -hmm. and uh, all different kinds <clears throat> of depth and all different kinds of textures. Mm -hmm. And there's also fragments of art from many different times in my life. Therefore, yeah. I have dated my paintings uh, 1981 because I know I did that little square in the box in 1981 and I did another part of the painting in uh, uh, 1985 and I, I see, oh, the black, I know exactly when in my life I did that. It was right after I got back from my voyage. I was set up in a studio near the boat on the waterfront in Long Island City and I put the black on it. I then I thought, oh, this is good. Maybe I thought the painting was finished and I put it away. But later in my life, I said, oh, this is what I'm doing now. So I'm going to do this to the painting. So all of my paintings have many different years that I've worked on them and many different 
things and feelings. How many, many years does this go? And this well, is that's what a, I'm this saying. This is such a, a fantastic it, it, uh, work it may of ha, art. It, it may have started in... Yeah, you got uh, a whole spiel, uh, a whole uh, um, aspect right. of art, uh, right. figurative art. The yeah. uh, the, the you see, look again. There's a deep blue yeah. horizon right. far away, right. Right. but there's also a blue uh, nature scene closer in that square mm -hmm. in the middle. Yeah. That that uh, vertical rectangle in the middle is a painting that I made at sea during the Thousand Day Voyage, but it has collage pieces on it that were part of my art supplies that I did years before. And then later I collaged it onto a wooden panel that has lead on it. See those lead squares? And there was lead on it and there was the thick sand and the dark red earth that was on it. And there's even in the very uh, right hand side of the painting is part of a book cover. So I found these old books and I put that in there also. And there's another book cover that has leather in it. So leather is another element that's mixing with the alchemy and there's all of these different things in the painting. And I often have uh, something like the broken shard, white shards of plates, with, which are very textural and which come out at your eyes because they come off the painting. And the, below that, the, the violet going through the middle of the painting, that comes off the painting, but it also goes back and forth with the bright orange that's deeper in the painting. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving your eyes around in a lot of different ways in the painting, no, and I'm using is, a lot of different styles yeah, in the this painting. Is like, this is like an art, a piece of art how many of these would you have in the OVRA? And then um, how, uh, what, what is the direction in which it's going in terms of the expression of art through this, with this system that you're using? Well, I'm, I, well, I finished this painting, or I think it's finished, maybe five years ago. Okay. Um, uh, and I'm not sure that I would do more to it, but in fact, um, all of my paintings have to be open, let, to be, uh, uh, worked on at any given time. Let's look at a few more because okay, we're, we're, we're we are running out of time, left. and right. I want to look at a few more paintings. One minute and thirty seconds. One minute okay. only. We got to go real quick. Well, Let's we're almost through. over. Let's yeah. see a few more paintings. Well, yeah, we can run through all the, of them. The, these are not the paintings that in the show. The big one that's behind us is hanging in the show. Okay, it's, it's about uh, um, uh, eleven by ten feet, and it's an old sail. It has ropes in it and different sail material, and I painted it over the course of many different years. And this is the show that just passed. We that's had the that show there, that's up now, now it's in be, Chelsea. It's going to be the item of an it's item. Up, it's going to be uh, in the through New York the Times. end of of uh, October, and um, and I'm hoping that I can extend it longer. Do we do we have any more paintings that we can look at? Well, we're going to run okay. out of time. That's so the you had a good the look at the paintings, is you're too damn and I started should, to tell you, you the stories of the paintings because you're too interesting. You could be uh, carrying on with this kind of stuff for hours and hours. I think it is. It's, it's uh, true. You might be able to gain uh, the, uh, a sense. Of I can talk for an hour about one painting. You could do it easy with that. Thank okay. you, Reed. My you're, pleasure. You're, you're really an inspiration for a lot of people can derive from the work and everything. Congratulations on it. I hope the uh, art uh, comment and so forth that does leads to a great expression that gets the kind of uh, worldwide attention that it so richly deserves. Well, and I appreciate it. Thanks for being such a big supporter and thank you for helping me share it with the oh, world. You couldn't have that's done it what without, it's all about. You couldn't have done it without me. Yeah, you couldn't have done it that's without me. true. <laughs> I needed you all these years. <laughs> you would years. have had no problem. I was cowering. The exhibition is, the exhibition oh. is in Chelsea, yeah. um, Good, 548 yeah. West 28th Street. On the south side of the street, it's a ground floor gallery with big glass windows. You go walking along and you look over there and you'll see not my paintings in that big gallery. Not it's, and it's off. open through the uh, end of October and I'm sure hoping that I can extend the show. I will be trying to do that. Okay, thank you. Your pleasure to have had his perceptions. Your pleasure to have a share of his thinking. And he's a major figure that's going to be inspiring this society mightily in the right direction. Thank you for such a very well-led life. Again, Reed Stowe, uh, uh, our 